Hello everybody, um, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Anne Mensah, I'm the Head of Drama at Sky and I'm pleased, really pleased to introduce two game changers to you today. Kelly Lee, who is MD International Content and Talent for ABC Studios and Patrick Moran, Executive Vice President of ABC Studios. Um, today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about demystifying the US studio system um, with Patrick. We're trying. <laughs> we're trying. We're going we're gonna to do our very best. <laughs> um, we're going to find out what Kelly is doing. She's been in the UK for six months now. Okay. Um, so what she's doing in the UK, what she's looking for. And with both uh, Kelly and Patrick, we're going to look at why they're getting into working with the best talent globally. Patrick, that, I mean, in, incredible selection of shows. A lot of stuff. A lot of stuff, yeah. a lot of stuff. But also, mm -hmm. you know, eight new shows this year, mm -hmm. 14 returning series. Mm -hmm. I mean, an incredible roster, but significantly not all for ABC networks. Right. Can you explain? Yes. Because we have really here, I think, yeah, well, yeah, I understand, I don't understand. Right. <laughs> uh, well, it's even a little confusing to people in the US. Um, so we are the um, studio unit inside the ABC television group. Um, so that means that we produce the shows and we then license them to our network partners. Um, but then we then own them, so we distribute them both internationally um, in SVOD, later domestically. Um, so we essentially, I, I like to think we rent them to the networks, but we own them um, you know, from there. Um, we do a lot of work with ABC Network. Um, the big win for us, we always say, is a big hit on ABC from ABC Studios. Um, but in the US, we're not limited to that. So we have three shows on CBS, for instance, Criminal Minds and Code Black. Uh, we produce Devious Mates for Lifetime. Um, we're producing a pilot for Showtime right now. We have a show on Freeform. So we like to think that it's a kind of mixed portfolio, um, but ABC Network is our sort of primary customer. So when you're thinking about your year ahead, you'll start thinking ABC first, but that doesn't limit you. Correct, correct. And in fact, we want our show creators to come in with the idea that they're most passionate about, mm -hmm. the thing that they're dying to write. Um, and if that lines up with ABC, great. But if it feels like it falls outside of that, then we're happy to find the right home for it. Cool. And so then, Kelly, how does your role fit in with Patrick's role and the studio as a whole? So I just, uh, as you mentioned, Dan, um, I just moved here about six months ago to open up the international office for ABC Studios, uh, running uh, international co-productions, uh, format acquisitions, reversions, um, development, uh, local productions, and uh, it really is, it, we're expanding our business internationally. And it's Highly beyond, it. <laughs> yes, just a little, just uh, beyond, beyond the US. Yeah. Um, and you will be working, we'll get onto it later, but yeah. you will be working with um, content producers from the UK, but also globally. Yes, so it's not limited to UK, it's UK, Europe, Asia, Latin America, uh, Canada, it really anywhere outside of the US. Okay. So we'll come. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Yeah, we'll that. come. We'll come back to that. But I wanted to give everybody a sort of context for our bigger discussion. But to sort of dial it back a bit to the beginnings, mm -hmm. I was mo massively amused to know that you started it in an art gallery, which is massively <laughs> amused. <laughs> yeah, because well, like, I don't know anybody who started in the art gallery and then decided not to do it. Like, what happened? <laughs> well, I wasn't making any money. First and foremost, <laughs> I made no money, and. Um, I was living in New York and I had heard that you could read scripts for money and I had been an English major so to me um, it was like writing a quick English paper. You would write the script and then you would do what they call coverage and then you would turn it back in and they would give you, I think it was like 50 bucks at the time. Um, so I was doing that and I really liked the idea of dealing with material, with scripts and then later with writers. So it was out of desperation I guess that <laughs> so I sort of discovered this other side. And that led me into, um, into working in entertainment. Do you miss the art world? Well, now I can go to an art gallery. I can <laughs> visit as like, a patron. I don't have to work there. So um, I think we have the right balance at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but also, I mean, in terms of shifting from one place to another, obviously, you know, Kelly, you're really well known for running casting at ABC Studios for, and Network for uh, you know, 15 years. Yes, a long time. Why the transition into the much broader role, um, and how are you finding it? 
Sorry, I was still thinking about um, Patrick's story about working in the art gallery. Um, <laughs> I have not, uh, I don't have an interesting background as Patrick. Um, I started uh, in casting while I was going to university mm -hmm. and uh, worked at, first started at Warner Brothers and then to ABC and worked my way up. And, you know, going to your question, I, the transition has not been um, that different actually. Mm -hmm. um, in my role running talent casting at ABC, I worked with, was fortunate enough to work with the greatest storytellers. Yep. Shonda Rhimes, John Ridley, and a slew of wonderful creators um, who have worked at ABC and are currently working at ABC, studios and ABC Network. Um, so in my new role, I get to work with these great storytellers mm -hmm. and now help them um, and support them in their vision of uh, of creating new stories on the international side. And, ho and what, that's on the US, but on the international side as well. But then what, because you could have done this role in the US, what pulled you into the international side of it and to, to take the, you know, your work with creators, but to, an, into, to a global platform? I think it's really important when you're having an international position to be in an international location. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be easier for me to have stayed in Los Angeles. However, London is a really great hub for incredible talent, and this is the place to be. Do you, do you feel that you have a foot in both camps, or do you feel like you're rooted in the UK? Well, I am rooted in the UK because I have a home, <laughs> and um, I've been here, you know, again, six months. Um, you know, I have friends and family in the US, but this has been, it's a really a great balance because I've been able to go back and forth, mm -hmm. um, but I am rooted in the UK. I mean, the, having Kelly yeah. here is really part of a kind of global growth strategy for the studio. Mm -hmm. We didn't have anybody prior to this um, dedicated full time just to mining the international space. Um, so Kelly's move and transition to London is sort of critical to our growth going forward. And that, but that growth is seems to me when we've been talking to be very, very, very talent based. Correct. So, I mean, in terms of the international creators that you're now both looking at, you're you're saying it's easier to do that based here. But have you found it difficult to reach out to people? <laughs> or no, it has not been difficult actually. Um, I have met with really incredibly talented creators here, not everyone yet, mm -hmm. but I've met a number. Um, and again, in the UK, throughout Europe, and Asia, mm -hmm. so far. Um, but the system here is different to the system in America. So obviously, um, it's much more agent driven. In the Gold Rush session we were in before, that like Ben was talking about how agents package, whereas we don't do that so much sort of globally. Has that, been an in, has that been difficult or? No, I think that, you know, we, we were actually having a conversation about this. There are some differences in process, deal making, um, expectations. Other than that, a great story is a great story and we want to find that next great story. When you talk about the differences, can you allude, can you? <laughs> <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, I've been here for a short time and I think for differences, it's really more of, it's a different deal making system. Mm -hmm. And I would say different season, mm -hmm. there's not as much of the pilot season model yeah. and there isn't the episodic orders that we are usually, we usually have in the US like 13 episodes versus 22 mm -hmm. episodes versus six episodes versus eight episodes. I think those are the, probably the biggest differences. And do you um, create your strategy for the, you know, the inter your international outreach together or is that something separate or is it something that's still evolving? It's together. Yeah, we talk frequently. Yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, the other advantage of having Kelly here, there, the nice thing about sort of that the world is getting smaller, we're all seeing more shows from the international space. We've all seen you know, Happy Valley, we've seen Black Mirror, we've seen Trapped, we've seen all of these shows. So we're becoming very familiar with the talent pool that exists beyond the US. That said, I feel like, you know, I'm surprised there's anybody here because Sally Wainwright speaking next door. Right. Like we all know who Sally Wainwright is. We've all been pursuing her. Um, having Kelly, I think, is in, in London helps identify that next generation, mm -hmm. sort of having sort of boots on the ground. I think who are the writers that 
are sort of more kind of up and coming, mm -hmm. and how can we be exposed to them earlier? But then, but then you, I mean, you are already working with some of the most incredible people in the U.S. I mean, you know, Shonda, John Ridley. Mm -hmm. What's, what's, the, what's, the, what's the secret to pinning John Ridley down? <laughs> well, John Ridley, it was, um, it was very specific. Um, this was, I had worked with John on a show a long time ago called Platinum that aired three episodes. Nobody had seen it. Um, but I had a relationship with John. We had an idea for a show um, sort of loosely based on a case that might capture the public's attention. So we called John, we pitched the show, he came back a week later, he's like, I, I don't like your idea. I have this other idea that I think is more interesting about doing a very small case that then ripples through a community, but using that as a means to explore kind of race and class. Um, so it was just sort of, I had like, the, we had the tiniest kernel of something to share with him, but he came back with a much sort of fleshed out idea. Um, and then he won his Academy Award, which I was, made us look very smart. But <laughs> we were, had been in business with him prior to that, um, you know, and was so happy with what he did with season two of American Crime, um, and hope that our relationship with John continues for a long time. But I mean, a lot of the people you're working with, they're, they're, they're proper auteurs. They produce, they write, they direct, in John's case. Is there a secret to keeping that talent part of your studio group? Well, it's a couple of things. I think, yes, we would like to think that we, um, we give our show creators an enormous amount of support. I feel like we're as good as the talent that lives at the studio. Um, and I want them to feel that they can pursue their creative vision, the idea that they're most passionate about, and that they will get an enormous amount of support from the studio. Um, I also feel that we should be honest when we feel like something could be better or we have thoughts, so it should really be a good dialogue back and forth. Um, so first and foremost, I want it to be an environment where they feel sort of safe and protected. Mm -hmm. um, I will say, though, that we have kind of a mixed portfolio of writers and producers. You know, John Ridley, we had sort of knew John before. Um, we have writers like Kitsis and Horwitz who created Once Upon a Time, but had been working at the studio on shows like Lost going back a long time. And they were writers that we had identified early in their career that we thought were you know, eventually going to be superstars. Um, and so we invested in them and have a long relationship with them. So it's either finding great talent that lives outside the studio that we can recruit, mm -hmm. or it's about developing great writers and talent that are kind of growing up on our shows. Um, so hopefully at the end of the day it feels like um, a mix. And do you think that's the same ethos that you will Absolutely. apply? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So uh, big, talented, marketable writers, creators, mm -hmm. writers who are also interested in a different type of show, maybe a reinvention, mm -hmm. and then the great new discoveries. But I mean, this, will, are you looking at pulling them into the same sort of talent deals that you have in the studio or doing something different? No, it's a little, we are modifying mm -hmm. actually for mm -hmm. the international market. And each market will be slightly different, really more relevant to whatever that market is. If it's mm -hmm. UK specific um, or Europe, it's not going to be just based on our US standard deals. Oh, that's really interesting. I yeah. want it to be, I hope that it's fluid. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I, I hope that the writer and the idea kind of lead us into the right sort of form for the project. Um, and whether that's sort of writers that we discover sort of outside the US, you know, there are writers that are working at the US, in the US that have said like, oh, I would really like to develop something, you know, with you guys internationally because they have an idea or they have something that they think might lend itself more outside the US than inside. So we, mm -hmm. I hope that it becomes sort of fluid back and forth. And would, when you, we talk about talent, I mean, we've said writers, would you consider producers as part writers, of that? Writers, yes. producers, directors, yes, okay. and actors. And how far would you in that sort of freedom versus control and telling people that they need to be better, how do you see that working with producers? In terms of, would you still have that sort of oversight role to have to, yes, because we want to make the best show possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it'd be, it would, it's really more of a partnership mm -hmm. more than anything. And I think that's, um, you know, we were talking about this in that we're here in the international marketplace for 
partnerships, finding the best talent, and creating, creating great partnerships. Yeah. And that's how I would view that, working with the producers. No, I mean, I, yeah. absolutely. This, it seems to me to be the big open goal. The more partnerships you can make, the sort of the different sort of shows that you can find if you do that. But do you think that there are specific cultural challenges that come with trying to make those partnerships in outside of you at the U.S. with a U.S. studio? Are people nervous of you and your size and scale? I mean, you look at those shows and you go, "I'm nervous of you," and I'm just sitting here. <laughs> I don't know, should we ask the audience? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are you, what, are you talking to yeah. people already? Are you yes. finding yes. people yes. open? Yes. Yeah. I do think what we bring, yeah. um, you know, we're part of the Walt Disney Company. We bring an enormous... Um, distri- enormous. <laughs> yes, but a distribution pipeline that I think ultimately benefits the shows mm-hmm. where, you know, as they're distributed internationally, we have just amazing resources that we can leverage that can help, you know, find the right home outside of the U.S. for all of those shows as well, and mm-hmm. international success is so critical to the studio. Um, I mean, when we think about just looking at the clip, you know, whether it was Grey's or Criminal Minds or Scandal or, or Once Upon a Time, those are global hits, mm-hmm. and um, that's really important to us and to our business. And I think because we have an infrastructure in place, I think we really can afford our producers the best opportunity to make their shows a success. Do you think, do you, sorry. I was just going to say, we, we also have incredible brands and franchise opportunities, and we can leverage the assets of the Walt Disney Company. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have Marvel, we have Lucas, Pixar, the Walt Disney Studios. It's a huge company. I'm scared all over again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm scared of it. And so you can, and so you can use that, you can leverage those, that property to work with international partners. Right. And are you looking at, just to be really specific, you're looking at, international broadcasters not just always taking it back into the US. That's right. Correct. International broadcasters and it's not just going back to the US. Would and it could be a partnership and I mean we have we're working on a show together we right are. now. We are. We I are. Mean, we have a you know Gorilla, John mm-hmm. Ridley, Sky Atlantic, um, and sold it to Showtime. So you, I mean, can, you, is it yeah, worth talking yes, about? Yes, absolutely. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, did you, you want to talk about it? No, you know, I'm, I'm asking the questions, I've got them written oh, down. Okay. <laughs> I mean, would you like, how, in your, from your point of view, how did that come about? Actually, do you want to talk about that, Patrick? Yeah, it was a script that John had um, written years ago. It was sort of a passion project of his, something he really wanted to pursue. Um, we came on sort of later as producers, given our relationship with John, um, and we helped kind of land the show at Showtime mm-hmm. in the US, which is another example of sort of the right show finding the right uh, broadcaster. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was largely out of our you know, long partnership with John that we were able to get involved. And I mean, it's been, from our point of view, it's been a wonderful co mm-hmm. It's looking marvelous, everybody. <laughs> um, just to, because a lot of what, what you're talking about here is a sort of diversity of voice. Yes. And I know you've done lots and lots of work on diversity. Do you think, in terms of game changing, is this, is this the future? I mean, is what you're talking about in terms of going beyond just any one culture, the way we have to go? It's about finding relevant stories in, our, in, our, in today's society, mm-hmm. and it depends on what that market, and what we're playing to really a global, mar- global marketplace. How can we produce globally relevant content? And that is something that's very important to mm-hmm. us. And you know, as we're here, you know, we're thinking about, is this show, can this travel? Is this a show that can work not only in UK, Europe, as, mm-hmm. as we're here? Can it travel to Asia? Can mm-hmm. it travel to the US? Um, we're looking at shows that could be relevant to really on a global audience. But then how do you, how do, you do that? How do you, the, does that ever conflict with the freedom you want to give your talent? I think for us, we tend to respond to a very specific point of view. Um, and whether that's Shonda, or whether that's John Ridley, or whether that's Kenya Barris, who created Blackish for us, um, we really um, get most excited when somebody has something very specific they want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and it almost seems like a little bit of a paradox, but somehow the more specific the storytelling, the more the universal appeal. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that sounds like, like a, yeah, sl- happy like a str- yes, Happy Valley is a good example. Um, so that's the thing that we really sort of gravitate to, are very strong, specific points of view. Um, and again, if that all works and comes together, hopefully that is a show that then travels sort of everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and our experience has been that they also sort of feel like the shows that just kind of rise above 
the clutter, when you feel like there's a very sharp person's perspective behind that show, I, I do think it helps to separate it from the pack. And I think your best shot of success is tapping into somebody who has something to say. So not putting together just the person from here, the person from here, no. the person here. Yeah, do not it. doing no. it by committee. No. I think that when you sort of do things by kind of that approach, I think that you're, it's, it's much harder to succeed when you're doing it that way. And is that international perspective feeding back into what you're doing in the US? So when you're looking at your huge, just massive US shows, are you thinking about are you thinking about the UK at all? Are you thinking about the international piece in that? Yes, and in fact, um, it's become such an important part of our business. Um, we've opened up more of a dialogue with the international sales team. Um, you know, our, our, where we sell the show in the US, it's sort of, we think of it as like the primary customer, mm -hmm. but we really need to be mindful of what the rest of the world might think. So we have sort of a check-in every couple of months um, with the sales, the international sales team, just to sort of hear from them what the markets are like around the world and things just to keep in mind as we go through a development process. And what's working in certain, mar I mean, really, what's working in certain markets? We are curious mm -hmm. to know what shows are really resonating with the different um, uh, viewers around the world. Do you find they're different? I mean, with your own shows and with what you're looking at? No, you know, I, I mean, because we're, if we're looking at spe uh, specific countries, we're seeing, oh, what is the show that's really working well? And it could be, I don't know, it could be a, a you know, European show, mm -hmm. it could be an Asian show, it could be really anything. Um, but I'm curious to know what shows are working there. Mm -hmm. Just your, but everything you're doing is going to be English language. Uh, or is it? Right now it's English language, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but maybe not, ah, yes. what's this place? <laughs> I mean, but going back to that diversity push, because I, I was really struck looking at the reel, how diverse it feels. I mean, mm. just it feels like every show feels like it's of the world we live in. I mean, will you be able to continue all the work you've done in diversity whilst you're here? Or do, has that baton passed over to somebody else? How, what, is your, what are your diversity plans going well, forward? Well, I think you put it yeah. best. Yeah. It sort of should look like the world we live in, <laughs> right? When you look around this room, the shows should look like the world that we live in, um, and they should reflect that sort mm -hmm. of accurately. And I think that the reel sort of demonstrates that. But you guys were at the forefront of that change in the US. Yes. Was that a deliberate strategy? It wasn't, delib it wasn't diversity for diversity's <laughs> sake. I, I think that for us, the shows that looked like they just had sort of an all white cast, just sort of look sort of old fashioned mm -hmm. to us. Um, and they didn't reflect the world that we lived in. Um, and certainly, and I don't want to speak for Shonda or John or Kenya, but it didn't reflect the things they wanted to write either. Um, and I give ABC Network a lot of credit because collectively between the studio and the network, we all sort of in, very easily embraced that approach. That's brilliant. Will you continue to run? I know you had the, um, your two, your schemes. Yeah. Are you, are, do the schemes still run? Yes. Would it's like ABC Discovers. So ABC Discovers, just to maybe talk about it in this room, it's, um, it was a program that we created about 15 years ago to address uh, really the, the lack of on-air um, diverse talent. And how can we help more, give more opportunities to diverse actors? And that turned into, we expanded into uh, diverse actors, writers, and directors. And that program, you know, we, I can say that we have some Oscar winners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lupita Nyong'o, who won an Oscar for 12 Years a Slave, she came from the program. Um, we have Gina Rodriguez, who's in Jane the Virgin, mm -hmm. she came from the program. Um, Chadwick Boseman, who's the lead in our Marvel's Black Panther, he also came from the program. And Jesse Williams and Grey's Anatomy, so the list goes on. Yeah. It really did help boost um, opportunities for diverse talent in the U.S. Um, that s continues, um, and there's also, there was a digital talent competition that we added on to that as well. There's, we are, I am having conversations with a few uh, companies here to talk about how to tackle that challenge here. Okay, so. that's really interesting. Yeah. Do you think there's a ch challenge here? There's a challenge no, here. No, what am no, I talking you know, about? There's a challenge I, here. I, I say it's really more of really just to, to address, is our, can we create more opportunities mm -hmm. for diverse talent? And I will always be passionate about that. And, but do you think it's your, your view on diversity that has helped you 
sort of be leaders in stepping forward to a glo- taking sort of the US model to a global market? I think the diversity approach, it's, it w- it's less about diversity and more about inclusivity. Mm-hmm. Okay. Inclusive stories. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. From the talent that you love. Right. Correct. I understand that you, because you went to Mumbai to find some talent. Like, is, do you, would you go to the ends of the, is it all about the relationships you have? Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> yes, I did. I went to Mumbai and um, tracked down one of the biggest stars in Bollywood, Priyanka Chopra. And, uh, you know, I met her really at a dinner party in Los Angeles and was just, you know, first of all, she's the most gorgeous woman you'll ever see. Um, and then I uh, really, I mean, once I discovered also what huge appeal mm-hmm. and her talent, mm-hmm. I um, tried to convince her for a couple of years to do television, American TV. And uh, she finally agreed, and she's the lead in our show, Quantico. It's brilliant. It was not easy, though. So the, uh, the, re- the rest of the story, Kelly's not telling the whole story. The rest of the story, I got a call from Kelly on like a you know, Thursday night, like at 7.30, saying, Priyanka Chopra is in town. She's in town for one day. I need you to be in the office tomorrow at 8.30, and you better be the most charming you've ever been. <laughs> so I was like, oh shit, like, I'm going to screw this up for Kelly. And it's true, Pranka comes in, she's stunning, she's beautiful, she walks in, and we all turned on the charm, like you've never seen executives be charming, and convinced her, she was about to sign a deal with another studio, and we convinced her to sign, sign a deal with us, and I think largely because we'd been successful having like, these great, iconic women mm-hmm. in front of our shows. Yeah. Um, and a long list of them, and we were in my office, and whether it was Carrie or Viola, and we said, like, look, like, your face belongs on a poster in my office like this. Um, and we were able and to... And it's there now. And, it's, and it is, it's, <laughs> there, it's there now. The Quantico poster is yes, up, it's there now. I have one in my office, too. Um, so we did, Kelly was amazing yeah. in identifying uh, Priyanka, and we worked very hard, and then, you know, the, the Priyanka, Quantico, the Priyanka matchup was actually relatively easy mm-hmm. once we had a role that she was excited about. Brilliant, brilliant. We will track down the best talent anywhere. Anyway. And I, I may fly there too. <laughs> Just watch out. <laughs> I've actually got a question um, on my iPad. Um, have you signed any UK talent yet? Mm. And if so, whom? Not yet. And I'll tell you once they are signed. <laughs> but you have your eye on right. someone. Yes. Maybe a few. A number of them. Yes. Yeah. And oh, you can't just say it. Can't. Can't. No, can't. We can't. No, well, the deal's no. not done. I don't yes. know who's going to post Once these the deal's done, away. yes. No, no, no. We'll let we ha- you know. We have worked with a number of directors that have been able to go back and forth. That, that's been successful for us. Okay. So. Yes. And, and by the way, and this is just the beginning. Yeah, Julianne. Oh, Julianne Robinson, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Lovely Julianne. Um, now I just want to know. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally. Hey, well, we'll yeah. develop the idea and we'll pitch it to you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. Um, I also have another question uh, to Kelly. Um, how does your average work day go? <laughs> and how many people are you meeting with? Oh my goodness, my average work day. Well, it starts very early. Um, and I, I've now gotten to the point where no, I, don't, no, I don't have 8 a.m. breakfast meetings anymore. I learned that that's a little too early when you're having conference calls at midnight with Los Angeles. So um, it starts about 8 maybe now, um, 7, 8. And then I have a bunch of meetings just really back-to-back meetings all day. But who are you meeting in particular? I'm meeting writers, producers, directors, agents, broadcasters, production companies across the board. Mm -hmm. And so given that most of the people here, I'm assuming, are producers and and sort of UK producers, but I understand there's lots of Norwegian and sort of European producers as well, what are the specific opportunities that you guys can offer now that you're here. I was also thinking that we have the first two rows of Disney and Sky, <laughs> maybe the first three rows. Thank you, everybody, for the support. Um, there are, you know, there's so many opportunities. It's really more about now I am in the UK. I want to get to know this market as much as possible and also at the same time expand beyond the UK. Mm-hmm. So I am, I'm going to be in Ger- Munich next week. I'll be in, hopefully we'll have to plan some sort of um, Scandinavia trip. Mm-hmm. So either I can meet there or we'll meet here. <laughs> and do you think, is there, uh, is there an ABC sort of house style that you're looking to sort of ex- like extrapolate or you? It's, it's character driven. Mm-hmm. We want character driven pieces. 
um, and we want to produce high quality, character driven, great, great stories. Okay. Because I've got another question. Uh, the UK has a large talent pool in factual. Um, are you looking at these areas? I'm not looking in factuals yet. I think I'm, at this point, it's really more on the scripted side. Okay. Don't leave the room. Stay <laughs> sitting. <laughs> Stay sitting. It will, it will come. Why, yes. why, why scripted? Uh, scripted, that's our, that's our business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and there, there could be an opportunity in the future for factuals. I think it's really more of, let's start with scripted. This is, a, this is a, a, what we produce um, in the US. And you know, there, there could be many opportunities in the future. Mm -hmm. We'll see. And what does that future look like? If you were sort of to project forward five years, what would your ideal AB, what would the ABC studios look like in five years' time? We'll have a number of shows on Sky. Mm -hmm. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, that it's not, that there really is more of a, you know, we're, we're uh, playing in a larger sandbox, mm -hmm. and it's really more of a global landscape of, is there a show that we think that, first of all, is there a show that we really believe in with this writer? And this writer happens to be from, I don't know, I'm gonna say Norway, because I see that there's mm -hmm. some Norwegian um, members here. And great writer, but the director is from China. Mm -hmm. It happens to be, it's a really great match, not because we're just trying to put two countries together, but it happens to be the right match. Mm -hmm. And then this could be a great Sky show. Mm -hmm or it's a really great BBC show, mm -hmm. or it could be a really great show for the US. Yeah. So it's really more of there are really no borders, mm -hmm. and great talent is great talent, and we're gonna find them everywhere, and we can hopefully put together the right package. Do you see, what do you see the most difficult parts of that sort of vision being? I think the most difficult part is actually, it's, there, there's a, there are so many people and there's so many um, opportunities around, and it's really more of how do you how do you go through all those different opportunities and find the right one? Okay. And for the producers in the room, why should they come to you guys? I mean, we've touched on it a little bit, but you know, what's special about ABC Studios versus sticking with BBC Worldwide or Endemol Shine? Do we talk about the Walt Disney Company? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would say that um, that's a huge. Uh, I would say being a part of the Walt Disney Company, also we, just in our history for, of ABC Studios, we support our creators. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's about partnerships. We hope that we can find the right uh, partners and um, together we can create a really great show. Will you deficit finance the shows? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we also, I think we offer the best of both worlds. We're aligned with a big broadcaster in the US, and yet we have the flexibility to go anywhere else if it makes mm -hmm. sense. So I think we get the home court advantage with ABC, and yet we're just as supportive of shows that exist elsewhere. Um, so I think we do give options and opportunities. Um, and ha are you thinking that any of your the people that you find here will go and work on your US shows, or is it just sort of international and then the US stay quite separate? So, no, actually some may, and that what Patrick was saying is some, some of our creators in the US, they also want to work internationally, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's really more a lot of crossover and overlapping. And finding again, I think we were talking about, it's being platform agnostic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the right show for the right platform? Right. And audience agnostic as well. So do you, you're not you're not heading towards a sort of mainstream versus a cable. You're right across the board. It depends on what that show is, mm -hmm. and what the, how what's the suitable audience viewership for that show. Okay. I have another question here. Um, I guess Patrick, this is probably specifically for you. Um, what do you think of the depiction of blue collar and working class? Um, of the blue collar and working class on UK television, and are there any lessons for ABC? Oh, interesting. Um, well, I talked about Happy Valley mm -hmm. as being sort of a favorite in the office. Um, you know, I I do think we have we have had kind of a nice mix um, on our shows historically, um, and we do we are sort of mindful to make sure that it's not sort of just that the shows are not, we call them rich people problems, mm -hmm. that, that, that the shows don't explore something that feels too narrow in its appeal. 
Um, so it is a debate we have in the office all the time to be mindful that we need the right kind of blend in all of the shows. And do you, you, you think that whether it's for the network or for sort of other broadcasters? Yeah, it's yeah. for anybody. I mean, again, you don't want the show to feel like the, the issues are so sort of small that they don't have kind of broad appeal. Mm -hmm. And, and going back to how you work with the creative talent, you know, when you talk about American writers wanting to come over to the UK, do you think there's big opportunities? Everybody's talking about peak TV and that there's too many shows and everyone's going to stop watching at the same time as what you're doing is expanding the opportunities. Right. Are those two things in conflict? or? Uh, it's a very good question. Peak TV is something that we've talked a lot about. Um, it definitely makes the environment that we work in more competitive, right? There's 400 plus scripted shows being produced. So it's not just your writer and your director uh, and your actors, but it's also your line producer, it's your stages, it's, it's sort of everything. So it does put pressure on the studio to just be smarter about what we're doing. Um, that said, I, I think that we continue to find the right home for the right piece of material. Um, we've been more nimble in our deal making than we've been in years past. Mm -hmm. So we've been able to sort of make deals with not just the cable networks, but with the Hulus and Netflixes mm -hmm. and the Amazons of the world. So again, when we hear a great idea, that's really where it starts. Um, and if that writer is someone we believe in, then we'll work extremely hard to make sure we find the right home for it. But I mean, it's, it's interesting because in that sort of mass of television, you're looking for those individual writers, and there's not, there's not enough people to go around. Has that driven your international expansion, the looking like the, the need? Is, so are you going international because you want to or because you feel like you need to? Both. Uh, you just heard my story about Priyanka and going mm -hmm. to India for the right talent. Yes. We will go, uh, go anywhere to find the, the best talent. And the, as you know, Patrick was saying, the competition for talent is so fierce in the U.S. We are expanding at the same time for as, for the global growth opportunity, but also to track down the right talent so that we want to work with. And do you feel that you're ahead of the other um, U.S. studios in this? Hmm. I, I don't know. Are we? You feel like you are because you're here and uh -huh. we're talking we're about yeah. it, but. I mean, again, this is a really important part of the studio strategy to grow our business. Um, so, and the fact that we have somebody sort of based here, we have our sort of LA, we have an LA office, we have a London sort mm -hmm. of international headquarters now. You know, Kelly and I talk almost every day. Like it's a giant priority for us to, um, to grow our business in this way. And why the UK? I'm interested, like, because you could have gone to Korea, you could have gone to Germany, you could have gone anywhere. What was, what was interesting to you about the UK? Again, it's the hub for so much talent, mm -hmm. so much great talent. Um, and the language helped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, we can open it up to, uh, I've got more questions to ask, but just in case there's anybody in the audience that has a question over there. Uh, good afternoon, guys. I'm Jake Hunter. I work at Business Insider. I, uh, I just want to, given that Vice are here and the fact that Disney also has a stake in Vice, could you ever imagine a scenario where ABC Studios and Vice pot potentially work on something together? And, and if so, what, what, what might that be? Um, it's probably too early to tell. I saw Shane's speech yesterday. I found it wildly entertaining. And I fo watched the follow-up today. You know, I, I think... Um, I appreciate that he wants to be super disruptive. Um, the one thing that he said that I hooked into last night and today was that, you know, for him, it's about really compelling content. That's a philosophy I think that we also believe in, that, you know, super smart, compelling content is the thing that will attract viewers. And to Kelly's earlier point, you know, be platform agnostic and, you know, can be distributed anywhere. Um, but very, very early days on the... Uh, the vice front. And actually there's a similar follow-up question on this in terms of um, how do you see the relationship of your studios evolving um, with the other SVOD players like Netflix, um, for, for instance the Marvel deal, and right. do you see any risks in that? Um, well we consider the Hulu, Netflix, those are other buyers for us. Okay. Um, 
We shop material to them. We have development with everybody. Um, we're partnered with Marvel in the Netflix yep. deal. Mm -hmm. and, and that was, again, it was you know, a conversation about we, we're doing something on ABC. We have Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but they had this other idea that just seemed to make more sense in the uh, SVOD space. So they you know, sold these additional five shows, I think, to, to, to Netflix. <laughs> so, you know, it, um, so it was, again, another opportunity to have kind of a mixed portfolio. Um, you know, we continue to shop to now Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, YouTube is now a player in that space. So we consider all of them sort of buyers for us, potential buyers for us. Does it make your job hard or easier to have all those buyers? Hmm, both. I think both. Uh, it's just you, keeping up with the market, keeping up with what all of these buyers are looking for. Um, everybody's on a different calendar as well, mm -hmm. so trying to identify the right season to be developing material can be a little bit tricky. Um, but it's exciting that we can do so many different types of shows. Um, and I think it's great for our show creators to feel like they have that much opportunity. That's cool. Funnily enough, with a follow-up, is what is your relationship with short-form narrative and interactive opportunities? That will probably be the next thing that we want to conquer, okay. is really thinking about short-form, thinking about digital. Um, again, very early days. Um, international was the next yeah. big yep. sort of piece of our business we wanted to get right. And from there, I think we'll be pursuing um, you know, something in the digital space. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Hi, Anne. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Hi, Hi. Patrick. Um, I'm Michelle Matheson. I'm a talent exec for Shiver and Label One. Um, besides the amazing talent that's attracted you to come back to the UK, what programs, what scripted programs have you seen here that really sort of set you alight and you think, my God, I wish we'd done this? We have a long oh, I have list, a lot of actually. Shows. I mean, Happy Valley we talked about. Yeah. I was riveted by Dr. Foster. Mm -hmm. Couldn't stop watching that. Luther, I think because of, not just because of Idris Elba, great storytelling. <laughs> um, I have such a long list. I mean, there's so many great shows um, coming out of the UK. Yeah, and all of those, Black Mirror was another one. Yeah, Black Mirror. Yeah, Catastrophe was another great, yeah. There's a long list of shows coming out. Do of you have a favorite of your shows, your own shows coming up next year? Are you allowed to say? No. <laughs> <laughs> They're all your babies. I'll tell you, right. I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. Yes. Uh -huh. you later. <laughs> Any other questions? Because I have more, I have what's brilliant, I love this machine. Mm. Um, uh, although, so the, I, this is, this is a long one, but I think it's a good question. Although there's been great strides made in terms of diversity, US TV is still arguably the preserve of beautiful people, whereas UK mm. casting invariably features people of all shapes, looks, and sizes. <laughs> <laughs> They're laughing because it's true. That mm. <laughs> would not even likely to get a read in the US. Do you think that'll ever change? I think we actually, our shows. I do too. Have I think that it's evolving. A very and wide yeah, range of casting. Okay. So is that deliberate or just it's, does everybody coming in and it's slightly all, fatter form? It is, I don't know. It's really about who's the best person. Okay. Right. It's always been about that. And I think that, that the idea that everybody had to be sort of that degree of perfection, I think, I think we've moved past that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think it is starting to feel like there's more of a blend. You know, really? when I think about a show like American Crime that does have sort of a mix of, sort of types. Um, you know, and that was really sort of John's vision for the mm -hmm. show, but something that we all really embraced. But do you think that that, because American Crime sort of faces cable as well, mm -hmm. as, although it's brilliant that it's on network, do you think that that's something that has come from cable into network, or do you think network always had that capability? I think it'll, I think it's an evolution. Yeah. And I think it'll be a long evolution, but yes. But it's going mm -hmm. that direction. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. and we have another show, American Housewife, features sort of, you know, shapes and sizes, thank you, Erica, uh, that'll be on in the fall, um, that I think is a, you know, we'll, we'll feel hopefully like a fresh take for a lead. Brilliant. Yeah. Which actually leads me to another one of the questions, and before I go back out to the audience, um, can you talk a little bit more specifically about your comedies? For the, just in general? Mm -hmm. I mean, again, the, the, for, the, for us, the comedy is very much the same philosophy as the drama. Um, you know, for something like Blackish, 
super specific point of view. That's Kenya Barris. That's sort of his experience. Um, he has something to say clearly, um, which again I think is really sharp. It's very smart. It's very contemporary. Um, we have American Housewife, where there's a woman named Sarah Dunn who created this show. Again, it was a really strong point of view about a woman living in Westport, Connecticut, who felt like an outsider, um, who felt like her story wasn't being told. Um, and that was the thing that we got behind. When somebody has something that feels very clear that they want to say, it's, it's easier to get behind that and to sort of watch that voice then sort of cut through the process in development and production. Because mm -hmm. you, you find yourself always going back to the voice, right? That's the sort of the thread that I think kind of gets you to the end and will make the show um, successful or not. Do you think that US voices are different to non-US voices? Like, are you finding a difference? Or is a storyteller a storyteller a storyteller? A storyteller is I a agree. storyteller, yeah. Would you look, but are you, would you look for differences? Is, is, there, is there a benefit to finding differences in the voices? There is a benefit in that if it's a fresh take or a fresh voice, mm -hmm. we're going to want to watch that or see that or read that. Um, but it's, it's, you know, a great story, story is a great story. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody else have a question? Because I've got lots here. Yes. Uh, my name is Judy Craig. I'm one of the screen commissioners in Scotland. I'm sure you, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, my name is Judy Craig. I run one of the screen commissioners in Scotland. I'm sure you'll be aware there's a Disney Research Lab right here in Edinburgh. Um, to, to what extent do you guys sit down ever, I know you've got packed schedules, but do you ever sort of sit down at some great big convention and talk creative stuff? Or uh, do you work completely independently of the other units of the organization? Oh, well, we wouldn't have one, one big room. It really is more of we have relationships throughout the company, and we have more individual or uh, department by department uh, meetings, but it wouldn't probably be in one big room like that. Any other questions? Oh, one at the back. Hey, Faraz Osman, I look after a company called Lemonade Money. Um, you mentioned earlier about short form and digital, which is a great space for like smaller indies to start connecting with huge networks like yourselves. And it's a, it's a it seen in the past, it's been a good way to start those sort of relationships. However, you guys at Disney obviously have a relationship with Maker, mm -hmm. who are huge and specialize in that area. Um, how, how is that going to work? If, if you started exploring how that's going to work, is all of that content going to be commissioned from Maker? Or is that something that you are going to look to open out to indies like myself? I mean, again, it's yeah. very early days. But one of the reasons why we were interested in short form was, to your point, um, really an opportunity to incubate talent so that if there was an idea or a writer that was still kind of early on in the development process, it felt like another opportunity to kind of take some shots and to try some different approaches and to see, you know, are those ideas that ultimately could migrate to um, the linear space. But again, sort of very early, very early days. Um, to pick up on the question on the iPad, um, does, does ABC Network have a first look on all the projects that you're going to develop, Kelly? And um, how much say do your creators have in what partner they end up with? Mm -hmm. Uh, ABC Network doesn't have a first look. I mean, we're all, I mean, it's a privileged relationship. We're um, partners. Um, but it's not an automatic first look. It's, it's not an automatic first look. I th it will always be, as we talked about, it's for the right, the right show at the right home. And how much will your partners have a say in that home? It will be collaborative. Mm -hmm. We'll have a conversation. I think it's really more of let's all decide together what's the right home mm -hmm. and let's make sure that we get it there. Any other questions from the floor? I have another question here. Um, has the competition for talent ever been so intense? I mean, we've talked a lot about talent being the driver under your business, um, given the arrival of players like Netflix. Yes, the competition for talent has been so intense. And every year we think this is the most intense, and then the following year it's even crazier. Yes. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Is it impossible? I mean... It's not impossible. No, I think it does. Um, put up more pressure on us um, to go out and sort of look for great sort of writers, directors, producers. Um, I, I don't think you can take a passive role in mm -hmm. that sort of relationship anymore. I don't think. Got to go to Mumbai. Right, got to go to Mumbai. You can't sit in your office <laughs> yeah. and wait for an agent to call and say, "Hey, I want you to, you know, 
meet so and so. I think you have to go out and sort of and you know actually put some legwork into it. Um, so it forces us, I think, to be very proactive about the search. Do you think it'll push you towards sort of newer talent? I mean, or do you feel that like you're always going to need to go to the big experienced people given the scale? I think it'll continue to be a mix. Um, when we're working on a series that's in production, we work very hard to identify who we think will ultimately grow into, you know, again, like those superstars. Um, Pete Nowak, who created How to Get Away with Murder, um, was a mid-level writer, but clearly a super smart guy um, with something to say. And he was one, you know, I think emerged from the pack very early on that we thought, no, oh, that guy's going to have his own show. Um, so when he came in and pitched the idea for um, the series, I th think that we were primed and ready to mm -hmm. get behind him. I mean, do you, I'm assuming that you guys can't like metaphorically always be the people who have to go to Mumbai. Do you have a big team looking talent scouting for you? I mean, or, or is it you? <laughs> well, we, we are, this is, this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Building the team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Building the team. Um, going back to the questions on the iPad, um, are you only looking at organic growth internationally or do, um, or are you also looking at acquisitions of production companies? Hmm. I would, organic growth. <laughs> For now. Yeah, for now. Mm -hmm. For now. Any other questions from the floor? Oh, right here. Hi, I'm Sahel from the Entertainment Commission at the BBC. Uh, Quantico is an amazing show, uh, and Priyanka is brilliant casting. How risky was it to put an Asian actress at the, as a lead of a show where the subject matter was her being labelled as a terrorist, mm -hmm. considering the kind of culture of fear of, of well, which is everywhere at the moment? Mm -hmm. How much of a risk was that? We didn't even, that didn't even, that we never even <laughs> thought of that. Of yes, <laughs> yes, that was not even a factor. The factor was she is a superstar, she is so talented, right. and this is the right role for her, and let's put her into this, and, and she agreed. And were you surprised by the success of the show? I, you know, I, I'm so excited by the success, um, I was not surprised. No, and uh, not only was it Priyanka, but it was Josh Schaffern who created the show, who was another writer that we knew and loved and you know, really believed in. And I think the combination of Josh and Priyanka, I think there was something very special that happened between the two of them. That's exciting. Oh, any final questions? We've probably got time for two more. Oh, another one in the front? No. Nope. Oh, sorry, another one at the back. Hey Sophie. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you liked Happy Valley and Dr. Foster. I just wonder if there's any other shows outside of the UK, European shows that you've liked? Trapped. Obsessed really with liked. Trapped. Yes. Yeah. Obsessed with yes. Trapped. There, there, there are others. I have um, to. Why well, are you obsessed yeah. with yeah. Trapped? Yeah, you have to explain that because so I don't even know what Trapped, trapped is. The Icelandic series. Um, I love that we're ahead of Anne. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I have to really think about um, what, I mean, I love Why did we like Trap, though? Was that the question? Yeah, I really, like, what, what is it about Trap that is... Can I tell you what it was? Because we had a lot of conversations about this. Um, it, we read so many scripts, we look at so many shows. Um, it's, I think you, you become conditioned to certain things feeling very telegraphed. Mm -hmm. You sort of see things coming, and I thought this particular show, and by the way, I have no affiliation, never met anybody involved, it's just a show I liked, but I thought there was such a great sense of surprise, mm -hmm. um, and that to me as somebody who can be, you know, I don't want to say cynical, but I do read a fair amount and you do see things coming, but I did think that that was a show that just felt like you were on the edge of your seat and did not see the twists and the turns. I thought there was something about the way that story was crafted that was really remarkable. Okay. Same. Check yes. it out. Yeah. I'm, I'm seriously, yeah. seriously, <laughs> note yourself. I mean, literally. But I mean, is that? It's because it's really interesting. Because actually, that feeling of just really desperately wanting to meet the program makers that can come up with a thing that surprises you. Mm -hmm. Is it? Are you finding that it's happening more now? You're bigger. Like now, you're looking outside the U.S. borders, or is it just still always going to be the rarity? But this is this is also, as I mentioned, that. I'm fascinated by what shows are working in different markets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to know what is that show that's working in, I don't know, I talked about Italy, I'm thinking about all my favorite countries yeah. um, to visit. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, it's what's working there, what's that show, why is it resonating, let's watch the show, who are the writers, creators, producers, mm -hmm. who, who's the director. So, 
the same time, we get to do what we love to do is mm -hmm. go and not only watch great television, mm -hmm. but track them down and hopefully work with them in the future. Brilliant, brilliant. One more question, any more questions? I'm getting the, I'm getting the time up high, so this is anything more? No? Well, then it's a very good moment to get the time up high from over there. <laughs> um, I just want to thank Patrick and Kelly. Thank you so much for talking thank to you. us. Thank um, you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank um, our sponsors, the British Film Commission and Creative Scotland. And thank you very much for all coming and for asking tons and tons of questions, which is brilliant. So thank you, everybody. Yeah.